Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Southeast. We are so happy that you are joining us for worship today. My name is Sarah. This is my friend Tia. We're really glad that you're here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things we say around here is that we want to connect with you. Um, so it's super simple to do that. Just text the word CONNECT to 733-733, and someone from our team would love to reach out to you. They can pray, answer questions, just yeah. get to know you. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of our favorite things. We yeah. love to connect with you guys. <laughs> but you know, Tia, as summer is approaching, it makes me think of camps. And yes. we love camps around here. Tia is actually one of our high school ministry leaders. I serve in high school ministry as well. So we know how important camps are. And there's one really cool way that you can be a part of camps this summer. Really throughout the whole weeks of June and July, we have camps from elementary school, middle school, high school, Shine Ministry. You can actually pray for camps as they're happening. You can text PRAY, the number four, camps to 733-733 and just really be a part of what God is doing through camps. We would love for you to partner with us. Yeah, well, Sarah, you know, another way that you guys can um, join us and partner with us for camp is to give financially. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have families in our church that would be so blessed by your gift of generosity to send their students to camp. And so it's super simple to do that. Head to our website, se.church slash camp. You can find out all the information you need to, to know uh, what camp you want to support um, yeah. right there. Also, if you have a student that you want to go to a camp, you can head to that website and register them there as well. Oh, yeah. Pray mm -hmm. for camps, support camps, yeah. register for camps, all those things. Yeah. But, you know, guys, anxiety is a word that we have heard so many times throughout our culture in the past few years. It really has become like this epidemic um, throughout our culture, really inside and outside of the church. And so Stephen is with Nick, one of our care team members, to really show us this new, really cool opportunity uh, for those of you who are struggling with anxiety just to find more peace in your life. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I'm here with Nick, member of our SE Care team, and coming up, they have an anxiety workshop. It's all about understanding anxiety these last few weeks Yes. extending ahead. So tell us a little bit about what is the Understanding Anxiety Workshop all about? We want to provide an opportunity that anyone can come and learn about anxiety. It touches so many lives, whether it be a situational thing or even a chronic diagnosis disorder. Yep. We wanted to give this out to as many people as possible. Yeah, because getting the info is super important. It's on Thursday, 745. It's at this campus. It's also online. You can head over to Facebook.com slash SE Care Ministry. Yeah, and make sure you check it out, whether it's online, in person. Uh, but the thing about anxiety with us is some of us have anxiety just showing up for something like this. It really is, especially caught in yeah. the season. So take us inside. What's going to be the vibe if I show up in person or online? What's the vibe? What's it yeah. going to be like? Is it a group? Do I have to talk? What's it going to be like? Yeah, so this is not an encounter group. So if you want to show up on in person on Thursdays, you could do that. You're not going to be required to share or be pushed into a recovery yeah. model. Uh, but also we'll be interacting with the contact in a safe place so you can sit at a table and say nothing if you didn't want any, any interaction. But also you can attend online yep. uh, and interact through chat as well from the safety of your home. Yeah, our goal with this, guys, is to take what the knowledge of people like Nick and, and your team have and, and get it in your hands because uh, knowledge makes a, such a big difference and allows us to take power. And so if anxiety is gripping you, a loved one, your family, you know if you know it's there, uh, this is a great opportunity right now that you can join in. Uh, and we're excited to be able to partner with them uh, with the Anxiety Workshop. Absolutely. Well, thank you, um, Stephen and Nick, for that information. If that's something that would bless you or your family, take this step to show up either in person or online. Yeah, for sure. Well, today we are continuing on in our series to break every chain. And Carl is preaching. He's going to be talking about um, finding freedom from the things that are killing you. Mm -hmm. and, and he's talking about grace and how yeah. we can continue to walk in the grace that God has given us. And it's beautiful. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage you, take some notes, really lean in engage with the sermon today, um, I think it'll it'll bless you. Yeah, for sure. And then Stephen's going to be with Carl after service, really unpacking more of his sermon and what he's really loved uh, preaching through the Book of Romans. So let's head into worship, guys. We'll see you after service.
Lord. He's worthy. Amen. Come on. Seamless are those who walk with him, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. take a few moments here to simply remember Jesus. We have a cup that you should have got when you came in. It has a cracker in it. It has juice in it on the other side. And this is just a moment for you privately in your own heart to just talk to the Lord and just thank him for Jesus. To just bless his name. Bless you, God. Because you did something I couldn't do on my own. You know, we sing this song, we lift up our holy hands. You know, the word holy means set apart. Scripture teaches us that the angels in heaven are gathered around the throne room and they're seeing the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, seated on our praise. Seeing Jesus, the lamb that was slain to his right. 
and they're just constantly singing holy, 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 worthy, because he's the only one. There's no other word to describe what they're witnessing right now in the throne room of heaven. When they look upon his throne, they just can't help but to say, set apart. I've never seen anything like it. There's nothing like it. There's nothing greater. There's nothing better than what my eyes are beholding. Peter teaches the early church as it was just beginning. It says the prophets long ago, they longed, they longed to experience the salvation that Jesus, Jesus would bring with his death on the cross. And he goes even further, he says, even so much so the angels are looking over the bowels of heaven with eager anticipation for those that would experience the joy of salvation something that they could never experience. So yes, they gather around the throne and they sing holy, holy, holy. They've never seen anything better. But we have a praise and we have a thanks that they don't. We've experienced this world. We've experienced sin. We've experienced shame. We've experienced death. We've experienced guilt. Praise be to God, we are free from it because of Jesus. And so our holy, holy, holy hands are different. We lift them because we say, my praise is reserved for you and only you, because there's nothing better. I've tried everything else. There's nothing better than Jesus Christ. So as we take communion, would you just simply thank Jesus for Jesus? Just sit there and thank him, thank him, praise him for he is holy. And then together, we're all gonna stand and we are going to join with those angels and we're gonna sing holy, holy, holy like we've never meant it before with everything in us. So take the next few moments and just thank Jesus.
God, you are holy. You are set apart. Your name is the greatest. God, we confess that so often in our lives, in our actions, in our words, and how we treat people, that something else is the greatest. That the job opportunity is the greatest, that thinking of college is the greatest, that the dream of a child is the greatest, that our marriage is the greatest, that a political party, a team, a, a sport is the greatest. And so we gather with other Christians across all our campuses, even online in our ARC facilities to just let you know that we're reminding ourselves that there is one name that is highest and that your name is the greatest. And God, we are so thankful for that scene in scripture where the angels surround your throne crying that you are holy. We know the saints are singing along with them. And Jesus, we long to be with them and with you. We long for you to return and set things right. But until that day comes, here we will sing that you and you alone are holy and the greatest and the highest. God, until you come back, we need your help because life's hard. So I pray as we open your word right now that you teach us something good, full of grace and truth that will help us honor you in our lives this week. It is in the great name of Jesus that we pray, amen. You can be seated at every campus. Well, my family just had the experience of a lifetime over Easter and spring break. We got to go as a family of six to Kenya to visit Southeast ministry partner there for a whole trip of 11 days. And it was fantastic to see some wildlife and experience God's creation. It was amazing to be mentored by some pastors there who gave us great wisdom. It was inspiring to see the work that our ministry partner is doing. I even got to preach on Easter Sunday at a church in the slums of Kenya, which was a huge honor from that pastor. But it almost didn't happen. Our flight itinerary had us go from Cincinnati to New York and from New York on to Nairobi, Kenya. When we landed in New York, we had three hours until takeoff. We went to our gate where they made an announcement. If you don't have your boarding passes yet, come see me at the counter and I'll print them out for you. So I took our passports up there, waited in line, had my confirmation number on our phone. When I handed her my passport, she said, where's your visas? I said, excuse me? <laughs> She said, I can't give you boarding passes without visas. And I said, oh, I was telling her how to do her job. I said, no, you can. Um, our group, meaning our church, sends people here not infrequently. I don't need visas. And she very kindly explained, if you don't have a visa, you don't get a boarding pass. I immediately contacted our team here, SOS, and they sprang into action. Multiple of our staff members in the missions department, we had, I think, travel agents and people in other countries and some friends of friends visiting consulates to see what they could do. Uh, two hours until takeoff, no visas. One hour until takeoff, no visas. They start boarding the plane. No visas. At this point, my family is standing here watching me and my kids have the expression that I know means, mom, what kind of crazy adventures that got us into this time. And after everyone has boarded the flight, I get a call from a friend of a friend of our staff who says, I got your visas, open your email. They're there waiting for you. I show them to the lady. She prints our boarding passes. We get on the plane. We make it to Kenya. It was awesome. Appreciate our great team here. But there is a moment in that experience where I was mentally giving up on the future I had planned, where I was thinking, Everything I thought was gonna be spring break, everything I thought was gonna be our destination and preferred future is not gonna happen. And I was com coming up with an alternate reality where I guess instead of seeing, Kenya, uh, seeing lions in the wild in Kenya, maybe we'll go to the zoo. And maybe instead of serving a foreign ministry partner over spring break, we can get connected with the local ministry partner for a day or two. The future I wanted was slipping through our grasp. Isn't that what happens often with your Christian struggles? That you're fighting a recurring sin in your life and you want to break through it. You, you see life in Christ on the other side of it, but it seems like it's not gonna happen and you just start to give up. 
Paul addresses this feeling in Romans chapter six. He says, well, should we just keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of this wonderful grace? The argument here is not that sin isn't wrong. The argument is simply, is it still worth fighting? Will I ever overcome this? Is it possible for somebody like me to change? Is this just who I am? Should I just give up and focus on something else? Don't you feel that way sometimes? Don't you have some area of your life where you try and you fail, where you resist, but you give in, when you know what to do, but don't do it, where you find yourself doing certain things or reacting certain ways without even thinking about it. Later, you regret it, but you just can't seem to change. And keep in mind, he's talking about sinning. He's not talking about things you wanna do in your life that aren't related to sin. He's not talking about trying to drink a gallon of water every day and not being able to do that. He's talking about things in your life that you're ashamed of, embarrassed by, the things you know are evil, you know are arrogant, greedy, lazy, manipulative, The things that even if it's not an addiction, clinically speaking, it feels like you can't resist. It feels like you can't not act that way. For me, it's my temper. In Kenya one day, we maybe on day three, we spent the day with different local pastors doing some home visits to see how they do outreach there. It was amazing to see. We were in the poorest conditions I've ever experienced in my life. I really can't imagine how anybody in the world could live in horror conditions. That night, when we got back to our living quarters, I brushed my teeth and without thinking about it, just grabbed the nearest towel and kind of wiped some toothpaste off on it. And my son, whose towel that was, got really annoyed. He said, dad, that was my shower towel. I was getting ready to take a shower. I can't sh- use that towel now that it's a toothpaste towel. Go find me another towel. <laughs> I lost my mind. I said, did you not see what we saw today? You're worried about a toothpaste towel. These people we visit don't even have a shower. They don't have a towel. I'm gonna send you back to the slums. It was one of those moments as a parent where like the target was right, but how I got there probably wasn't. And when I was finally able to humble myself about that moment, I I did say, God, will you ever conquer my temper? We all have sin issues that we feel like, the language Romans uses, is we're a slave. Sometimes we all get to that point where we think, I guess I can't overcome it. I guess I'll just focus on something else. So in the book of Romans, Paul is going to have a multi-chapter discourse about this. In fact, in next week's scripture, he's gonna open with this exact same question as he continues to dive into this. And the scripture isn't addressing the person who doesn't care about defeating sin. The scripture is addressing the person who's fallen so often to that thing and you've struggled so much against that thing that it seems inconceivable that you won't just need grace for that forever. See, too many Christians have treated this section of scripture we're opening as if it's a philosophical argument or as if it's a a theological debate. It's not. It's about every one of us who falls to the same thing over and over, and we wonder, should I just give up? I'll focus on holiness somewhere else, but with this, it just seems hopeless. And Paul, in the book of Romans, steps in to say, no, 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 no. You've lost the battle, but keep fighting the war. And he's going to show us how. So when I open the scripture, I think of the woman who looks at porn every week. And even in church, you're tempted to feel isolated, alone, because for some reason, whenever church addresses that, it tends to just address the men. And you keep stumbling to it, it's taken hold of her, where even if she goes a few days without it, it always drags her back, she can't shake it. Should she just give up and say, Lord, I need grace? And that's it. I'm thinking of the person who thinks you know everyone's motives You see what they don't do. You hear a phrase and immediately make a judgment about their evil heart. You don't wanna be that way. You wanna see the best and see goodness in people, but you don't. It seems like you can't help but assume the worst. It's just how you work. Should you just confess that every week during communion and say, Lord, give me grace. I'm thinking of the serial interrupter who has some combination of insecurity and arrogance where you just refuse to listen to others. 
You're always right. Your opinions are always better. No one can finish a sentence around you. You hate it about yourself, but you just can't not do it. So it's become, Lord, I guess just when you come back is when that'll get fixed. I'm thinking of the person who knows what you need to accomplish, but falls to the laziness of scrolling social media. I'm thinking of the dating couple who wants to be pure, but your bodies have desires. I'm thinking of the gossip who doesn't wanna talk about others, it just happens. I'm thinking of the person who's done deep soul work, but in moments of fear, the same old reactions come out. We all have things where we're tempted to think, maybe I'll just focus on something else since I've got grace for that. But Paul says in verse two, no. Since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Translation, there's something better. I read in the news last month, a story that re reminds me of this. Adele Andalore found out that a little while after her parents had died that she inherited their home in Queens, New York. It was multiple weeks after they had died and she went to visit the home for the first time when she found this out and had all the paperwork settled. She showed up only to find that there were homeless people who had taken over the house, even changed the lock on the front door. They didn't have a lease, they were there illegally. So she called the cops because they would not leave and she explained, hey, this paperwork shows I'm the owner, I need you to evict them. However, New York State has a law that if squatters have been someplace for 30 days, you can't kick them out without due process. So the police she had called to evict the people who were living in the home that she owned actually arrested her for trying to have them arrested. Now I cringe at a New York law that seems unjust to legal owners, but how often do I do the exact same thing with sin? Well, it's been here a while. I don't know how to get rid of it. Might as well stay. And we don't do that because we're proud of it. We just don't know what else to do. I think it's providential that we're coming to the scripture just a couple weeks after over 1,000 of you have been baptized. And I have more good news for you because just that move of God has not stopped in the past two weeks alone at our campuses since Easter, we've baptized over 200 additional people. And I hope, yeah. I hope that when you hear things like that, it never becomes uncommon to you how God is moving in this church. There are pastors and church planters and missionaries around the world who work months, if not years, for a single convert. And not a week goes by where we don't see someone born into the family of God. In fact, I was talking two Sundays ago, the Sunday after Easter, to one of our church planters, and he texted me to say, Carl, for the first time ever on a non-holiday, our church had over 200 people at church today. And he was blown away, and we were celebrated together. We were so excited. But the fact we get to see 1,200 people baptized in three weeks boggles the mind. You get baptized because you are attracted to the grace of Christ. But what also happens in that moment is you give your life to Jesus to say, hey, I want you to begin a, a lifelong process of heart surgery to form me into the image of Christ. So Paul in the book of Romans today is gonna to teach us what do we do when we're on the narrow path, but that thing's just killing us and we can't get rid of it. He first reminds us part of what baptism means. Look at verses three and four. Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. We weren't joined with Christ in believing we weren't joined with Christ in attending a church service. We weren't joined with Christ in anything else. We were joined with Christ in baptism. And baptism doesn't represent just the death of Christ, it's the death of us. Look at verse two again, we've died to sin. Well, why shouldn't we keep on sinning? We've died to it. How do you know we've died to sin, Paul? Verse three, because in baptism, we joined him in his death. We wanna give up on this thing and say, well, I guess there's just grace for that. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You're baptized. You died just as Christ did. Verse four goes on. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we'll also be raised to life as he was. Notice the tenses in these verses. We have been 
united in his death, that's baptism. We will be raised to life, that's second coming. This is talking all about baptism. I love all the baptisms we've had. Occasionally, there's an awkward moment in the baptistry. I was talking with one of our campus pastors who was describing Easter weekend when he was in the water baptizing person after person and his worship was going on and each person would come in. He would get to know them just a little bit. And specifically, there was a young woman who came in with a man and this campus pastor wanted to make the connection of why this man was helping baptize this young lady. And so the campus this pastor put his foot in his mouth and he said to her, is this your dad baptizing you? And she looked back at him and said, that's my fiance. <laughs> he will never talk ever again in the baptistry. <laughs> but verse six says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. You know, it's interesting to read the struggles people have who are enslaved and get set free to accept their freedom. For example, I was reading a story of a Christian man whose mission in life is to help women who are in sex slavery find freedom. And his ministry carried him to Cambodia. He went to a particular brothel and there's no legal way where he was to get these women out of their situation. So what he did is he negotiated with the brothel owner a price where he paid for the freedom of two women. That's how much he could afford. The first woman was just thrilled. She was so excited and grateful and full of joy and just ready to leave. The second woman, however, said, well, I'm not leaving. He said, why? I bought your freedom, come on. She goes, well, that man, the brothel owner, has my cell phone. I'm not leaving without my phone. He said, I'll buy you a new phone. The other women were telling her, leave. You can go to freedom. Just leave this place with this man. Trust him. It's going to be better. And she said, I am not leaving without my cell phone. So the Christian man went back to the brothel owner and negotiated a price and finally came back to the woman and said, look, I got your cell phone. Let's go. And her response was, well, what about my jewelry? What's going on there? The same thing that happens to us. We've been set free, but we're enslaved by the trappings of our former life. And Paul's reminding us, you're not a slave, you're free. Verse eight, and since we died with Christ, we know we'll also live with him. We have the hope of heaven. This life is not all there is. Even in this life on the other side of death to self is a better life with Christ. Now, how do we know this? How can we be sure of this? Paul reminds us what we celebrated a few weeks ago. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he'll never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. Again, everything we believe hinges on the empty tomb. Did you know that in the first several hundred years of Christianity, there was no set holiday called Easter? When I first heard that, I thought that was kind of weird. Like, that's the reason we believe. Why don't they have like a day like we do today? I think what we do is pretty good. And then I kept researching it further and discovered they didn't have that because every Sunday they celebrated like Easter. Every Sunday was centered on the resurrection and the empty tomb to remind us this is why we have hope. This is why we believe. And really, even though Christians said, hey, we do need a specific day just to make sure we don't miss it, the same is true today, that everything we say, everything we believe, everything we do as Christians all hinges on the empty tomb. So in reality, every Sunday for the Christian is still Easter Sunday because the empty tomb declares that Jesus wins and we are free. So happy Easter. <laughs> Verse 10, when he died, he died once. Some translations say he died once for all to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. When Jesus died, the power of sin died. It was broken. Now this can be confusing because we look at our lives and say, well, it doesn't seem dead in my life. What's going on? Well, the thing this makes me think of is the Lord of the Rings trilogy specifically the books, because the movies, as good as they were, cut out part of the ending, I think a key part of it that we see in the books. I know the movie lovers are like, well, that ending dragged on long enough. Thank you, Peter Jackson. But in the books, what happened is after evil Lord Sauron and the ring of power were destroyed and defeated, there's still evil that had overtaken the home of the hobbits, the Shire. So after the power of evil had been broken, 
they have to journey back home and in their home gather an army and have one final battle to rid their homes of evil. That's a great metaphor for verse 10. The power of sin has been broken. That happened on the cross. But now we fight the battle to eradicate it in our lives. But again, how? Because I have this pull to this thing or this mindset or this attitude and it feels irresistible. It seems futile to resist. I mean, it sounds great that Jesus defeated the power of sin. Okay, I'll remember my baptism and death to sin, but I still don't see how that translates to my life when my kids are driving me crazy and my spouse does that same old thing or I'm alone on Saturday night or the ad pops up or the thing is on sale or I feel the depression coming on or I have that same old reaction. Look at verse 11. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. You translate this as must consider yourselves. It's an imperative, we have to do it. Now, these three words that I highlighted are one word in the original Greek language. I wanna flip back to Romans chapter four that we studied a few weeks ago because I think it'll help us understand what this means and enlighten how we defeat the power of sin. Okay, Romans four verses three through five. Everything I highlighted is that same Greek word translated as counted here. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who believes, his faith is counted as righteousness. Here's what this helps me understand about this one word. Is this word means when this happens, it's the same as this. So in God's eyes, when Abraham believed, it's the same as if he's perfect in God's sight. And when you have a job, verse four, it's the same as getting a paycheck. And if you choose faith, verse five, it's really the exact same as you being perfect in God's sight. So when we flip back to Romans chapter six, and it says, you should consider yourselves, what it's saying is when you've been baptized, because remember what we just read, when you've been baptized, it's the exact same as if you're dead to sin. So, the way I'd say verse 11 is this, act as if the power of sin is dead. Act as if the power of sin is dead. It's kind of like that phrase you've heard, don't dress for the job you have, dress for the job you want. Like if you wanna be a C-suite executive, don't dress like you just got graduated from college and you're wearing what you wore to class every day, dress like the C-suite executive, talk like the C-suite executive, read what the C-suite executive reads and eventually you'll be there. That's what this is. Don't act as if you're a slave to sin. Live as if you're free from the power of sin. Scientists have talked a lot in recent years about neuroplasticity, the idea that no matter what your age, you can always make new connections and deepen them in your brain, that just as water, if it runs over the same path, will create a deeper channel, that the more consistent we have a certain thought, it will make a stronger connection in our brain. Paul says, choose to think, live as if you are dead, dead to sin. It's as if Paul knew about neuroplasticity before anyone discovered it in a lab. So think, what verse 11 would look like, what it would sound like in your life this week. The person who goes on sinning says, I'm just a cynical person. The person living as if sin is dead says, I'm a joyful person and I bring joy to each person I meet. The person who goes on sinning says, I overeat a lot. The person living as if the sin of gluttony is dead says, I'm an athlete and I'm training for the race God has for me. The person who goes on sinning says, school's a boring waste. The person living as if sin is dead says, I'm a scholar. I'm training for the unknown future God has for me. The person who goes on sinning says, I don't need church. The person living as if sin is dead says, I'm a child of God and, the, and I'm a vital member of Christ's body, his church. The person living as if sin uh, goes on sinning says, I'm just an addict. Whereas the person living as if sin is dead says, I'm a child of God and the power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. Victory is ours in Christ Jesus. We are no longer slaves to sin 
sin, we live as if the power of sin is dead and we're alive to God in Christ Jesus. So it's not, I'm lazy, it's today I'm a hard worker. It's not, I'm an adulterer, it's today I choose to be faithful. It's not, I'm a drunk, it's today I'm sober. It's not, I hoard, it's today I'm generous. It's not, I'm insecure, it's today I'm chosen. Because just as faith in God's sight equals righteousness for the Christian, baptism equals death to sin. So we live as if sin is dead and gone forever. And we're not naive to think we'll never sin. We walk in grace. We don't foolishly proclaim we won't struggle, but we will not be slaves to sin anymore. We will live as if sin is dead. This gets me excited. Now, very quickly, in verses 12 through 14, Paul's gonna give us three handles to this. Okay, verse 12 says, don't let sin control, and that word control means be king of. Don't let sin be king of the way you live. When, if you live under a king, you have no choice but to obey. And here's how I'd, re, I'd paraphrase verse 12. I'm a victor, not a victim. So often, Christians use victim language. With food, we say, well, I can't resist ice cream. I can't function without coffee. With sexual sin, I was made this way. My body has urges. With insecurity, that's how they make me feel. With greed, I can't be generous till I pay off all my debt. And that victim mindset comes out in our words. But scripture says we're more than conquerors in Christ, which means to live as if the power of sin is dead means I'm a victor, not a victim. Verse 13, don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Now that word instrument, I love it because it can be translated as weapon. Now, it talks up here of your body being an instrument of evil, almost as if your body is working against you. The thing this makes me think about tenderly is people I love who've had cancer. And it does feel like they are a victim of their body, their body's working against them. But the way I paraphrase this verse in my words, on a spiritual level, is my body as a weapon, not a cancer. I am not a slave to my body. My body is a weapon I use. Lots of scriptures talk about this. Job 31 says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. You use your eyes for good. Proverbs 2 says, turn your ears to wisdom. Do you seek out wise counsel and everything? Ephesians 4 says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up. Do you use your mouth to be an encourager? Romans 10 says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Do you view your body as a physical instrument to spread the gospel? Proverbs 31, she extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. Do you use your hands to serve those who are in need? Is your body a weapon. Verse 14, sin no longer is your master for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Here's my rephrase. I'm driven by freedom, not judgment. This actually makes me think of an old business parable that who knows if it was real or made up, but you've probably all heard it. It's that story of the pottery class that on the first day of the semester, the professor divides the class into two groups. And he says, okay, this group is going to be graded at the end of the semester on the quality of your pottery. You're going to turn in your best pot and whatever that looks like, how good it is will determine your grade. He said, this group over here is going to be judged on the quantity of pottery you can produce. So you show me how many pots you produce and we'll see which one, or see how many you do. Well, both groups immediately get to work. I mean, this group throws some clay on the wheel and starts going, even though they don't really know what they're doing. This group starts talking and debating and studying and analyzing. And at the end of the semester, this group turns in their pot and it's really good. You get a good grade on it. But this 
group turns in the whole stack of pots they made, and interestingly, they have better pots than the group that focused on one. And I think, although that's a great parable for business and entrepreneurship of, hey, don't give up, you just push through, you just keep going. I think there's a deeply spiritual metaphor for us there. That if you walk in fear of judgment, you're not gonna do anything. You're not gonna take a risk for the kingdom. You're not gonna take a risk in relationship. You're not gonna seek to better yourself because what if you stumble? What if you fall? What if you fall to that same thing again? But if you walk in grace and the freedom it brings, you know, I'm just gonna run full on for the sake of the kingdom and I'm gonna attack this sin and I'm gonna do this good and I'm gonna eliminate that evil. And if you fall, okay, doesn't matter. You got grace, you'll repent and move on and not let that hold you back and you'll keep going. At the end of the day, you're gonna accomplish more for the kingdom if you live in a freedom because of grace mindset than if you live a fear of what if I mess something up. I'm driven by freedom, not judgment. I don't know about you, but I've got things in my life, temper being one, where I say, God, are you gonna change that before you come back? And I'm tempted to say, well, got grace, so I guess I'll just go on sinning. But then I open Romans, and Paul says, no, 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 no. You died to sin. Or have you forgotten that in your baptism, you were joined with Christ? I think the conclusion today is if you want freedom from what's killing you, remember your baptism. I wanna show you two baptisms from the last week. First is Silas, he's 90 years old. He attended chapel on the Woods campus on Easter and said, I've been thinking about baptism for 70 years. It's time to be obedient to God's word. <clears throat> Second is Mike. He has spina bifida, struggles with depression, been without a mom for 15 years. But he heard king and country sing, God only knows. And he realized that's true. Only God knows my pain, but know what he does. And so I wanna give my life to that God. So I wanna ask, can you remember your baptism? Not the temperature of the water, who did it, where you were, what you were wearing. What I mean is, what, what Romans means is, do you remember when you, when you got grace? When grace wrecked you? When for the first time you realized the creator of the universe knows everything about me and he wants me. And you responded by throwing yourself at the feet of Jesus in worship and love and honor and awe. And you knew the truth of that old hymn that says the strife is o'er, the battle done, the victory of life is won. Powers of death have done their worst, but Christ, their legions, has dispersed. He closed the yawning gates of hell. Let hymns of praise his triumph tell. Lord, by the stripes which wounded thee, from death's dread sting, thy servants free, that we may live and sing to thee. Church family, these last three weeks, we have seen God move in a way that most people only read about in the book of Acts. But I just have to say, are you still holding out? If you are, I wonder 
if it's because you got this thing and you think either, well, I'll never overcome that or not even Jesus could do that. So I'll ask you what Romans says. Do you want to be dead to sin? Do you want to be raised to life in the second coming? If so, choose faith. Because when you believe, it's the same as being perfect. So humble yourself, repent, be baptized, lay down your pride, throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and he will lift you up to new life that'll begin today and last forever. Let's pray. Jesus, we want freedom from what's killing us. Sometimes it does seem that this thing is killing us. So we want to ignore it and move on to something else. But God, we say to you in this moment, we are not gonna give up. That even if we lost the battle, we're here for the war because we know you will give us the strength and power to endure and to win. God, I pray for the person who doesn't know you, who's resisting your tug on their heart, that you will simply overwhelm them, overwhelm them with grace so they say yes. It is in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray, amen. If you are that person, today's your day. And we're gonna experience some powerful worship here in just a moment. We're gonna see a bunch of people, a bunch of broken people like you and me get baptized to give their life to Christ. And as we're doing that, if you need to follow their example, wherever you are sitting, we want you to make your way on the first floor to the next step room where we have some staff and volunteers who wanna open the Bible with you, who wanna hear your story, who wanna pray with you, and who want to help you find freedom so you can live as if the power of sin is dead. Let's go ahead and stand. Let's worship our great God.
All right, Southeast fan, thank you so much for being a part of service today. In just a second, I'm going to be having a conversation with Carl. Uh, but before we go any further, what I want to let you know is that invitation, Carl, gave at the end of the sermon, you're not excluded. Regardless of where you're located in the world, you can always respond. And as a matter of fact, that's what we love to do. We love to figure out your next step with you, whether that's being maybe you haven't made that decision once and for all to say, I am dead to sin and I'm alive in Christ, and I'm gonna demonstrate that through baptism. I'd love to talk with you. That Connect text, that's your gateway with tons of people that have texted Connect and been baptized, regardless of where they're located. So we'd love for you uh, to do that. Joining me right now, though, is our speaker, our executive pastor, Carl Cool. How you What's doing? What's up, man? I'm what, glad to be here. Hey, what in the world, before we go any further, one of the questions we get about you, what in the world does the executive pastor of ministries do? <laughs> like, what is your job here? I keep people like Stephen in line. That's, That's true. my goal in so, line. So, I mean, I mean, one <laughs> element is Carl is my boss. But, yeah, tell us a little bit about like, your job, and then we're going to talk about you. Yeah, so we have three executive pastors, and we have uh, a lot of the div division of labor, if you want to yeah. call it that, is between, like, the business side of church because we have finances and HR and IT and yep, all that kind yep. of stuff and then the ministry side of it that works in tandem together so I work with our campus pastors our worship and production our missions crew even our central ministries teams including SE online yep. um, to try and help us unleash full force the church I love that before Carl was executive pastor of ministries mouthful uh, you were Carl the kid that grew up in Louisville that Southeast Christian Church long before this building and this place and yeah. all the things were happening you were there at a part of it. So when you think back to your childhood, yeah. and this is your church home, what I wanted people at home to know is this is more than you just coming for this yeah. job. Yeah. You came home. I did. You know, I grew up at Southeast from when I was six years old, uh, many buildings ago at, at this church family. Even I remember growing up when we were a one campus church and it was so full I had to sit on the stairs mm. just to get in the auditorium, which was just a really impressionable thing on me I've never forgotten because I think when you lift up Jesus, when you have community that helps people find their crew genuinely, that it's irresistible. Yeah. And church is not complicated. It's lift up Jesus, yeah. build community, make a difference in the world for hurting people and good things happen. Yeah, in fact, I yeah. even wanna go no, back no. to what you said a second ago. You were talking about the baptisms that we yeah. just experienced. I, I just want to point out that um, I got to see a breakdown by campus, and it was just so awesome to see the SC Online and multiple baptisms on Easter through yeah. the SC Online community. So just keep up the great work. So proud of you. Yeah, we love that. I love that in the 80s and 90s, they didn't take fire code too seriously. That yes. little Carl Cool, the kids could sit on the stairs. But when you think about those formative years, especially you were even telling me in elementary, you're in children's ministry. Oh, what what, what are some of those experiences? Oh, yeah. See, he set me up. That's, yeah. what, he, that's what he does. Yeah. Uh, I may or may not have been expelled from fourth grade kids ministry yeah. and had to sit in this chair of shame outside the classroom yeah. when all the parents came to pick <laughs> up their kids. That's all we need to say about that. I love that. that. But I love when you've talked to me before also about your high school experience here. You just said to yourself, if I can just get yeah. my classmates to church, yeah something will happen. What, what was formative about that? Yeah, you know, it, my youth group was that powerful where I felt that, yeah. that if I, I could get them to church, yeah. they would understand what grace was. And I tried to explain the gospel. I, you know, did my best evangelism tools yeah. to explain Jesus. But if I got them to church and they got in the environment, you know, with a, with a good preacher, not me who didn't understand things <laughs> and good worship and seeing other Christians just something happened where it clicked. And, and so for me, that was when I said, hey, I want to give my life to something like this. And I didn't know what it would, I never thought I'd end up back here, yeah. but here we are. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I did a funeral yesterday. Oh, wow. And there was a certain message Kyle gave that changed the life of the, dis the, the lady mm. that had died. And she wanted me to share at the funeral that message. She wanted people to go and, and hear what changed her life. I love and it. so I used a, par a portion of it and said, but really you need to go, you need to go watch this for yourself. Because that's what a lot of us have experienced online is, is that feeling of like, this is like, they're telling me things and I'm hearing truth and it's into a new perspective. When you hear those stories about online folks doing the exact same thing, like if you could just hear this, yeah. it would change your life. How do you get excited about where we're going now as a church? Like what's the future of this church family look like when you think about where we're from yeah. And now you get excited about where we're going. You know, it sounds boring, but it's more of the same. Yeah. Which isn't boring. No. Right? It's, hey, let's lift up the name of Jesus. 
let's run after hurting broken people because the people in scripture who are open to Jesus are those who are hurting and broken. We all are, mm -hmm. just those who recognize it. And let's invite them into the community we have that's based on grace and truth. And when we do that, everything else takes care of itself. And you know, it's you saying, come and see. It's you texting saying, click and watch. Yeah. You know, it's all the things um, to just expose people to Jesus and be so overwhelmed by grace that I'm not ashamed. I'm the opposite of the shame. I just can't not tell other people about it. And it's never been easier than ever than yeah. to get people in front of what's going on in this Absolutely. church. Absolutely. It's changed you, like being a part of the invitation and sharing and bringing people in. Uh, it could change the world. Like it could change the world. I just talked to the lady that that one message changed her whole life. Well, it, it is changing the world. Yeah. And not even that it can. Yes. Right. Sorry. And and I just want to say, uh, from me, I know you hear this from so many people. Uh, thank you to our SE Online community because you are changing the world. And the story Stephen and the team share church wide about decisions and decisions to follow Christ, decisions to evangelize, decisions to build community with other SE Online folks. Yep. Um, it's inspiring because this has never happened before in the history of Christianity. And some people are like, well, what do we do with online church? It's yep. like, what we do is use it for the kingdom. Yep. <laughs> That's what we do. And you're doing it and uh, you're blazing a trail that people are going to follow for the rest of humanity till Jesus comes back. So thank you. Yeah, I love, uh, love that. And, uh, you know, we actually have a, a family here that has a, a large group that watches with them every single week. And they've kind of formed a little church family uh, in, in Western, or sorry, in Western Kentucky. Yeah, in, in awesome. Town, Kentucky there. Uh, wanted to go into your message for a final question. Okay. Um, because I think it's so relatable is this idea of what do I do with the fact that maybe the penalty of sin is taken away from me, but it's power and presence are just, they're right there. What do you personally do each morning? <laughs> How do you, because the thing is you're not, I know you don't do this perfectly yeah. and you're very transparent with that, yeah. but what, what's that look like for Carl to strip the presence and its power in your life? What are some routines that you have to help do that? Yeah, you know, every morning, uh, I spend, I have a little journal and, and it's really short and I write down three things. Uh, another pastor taught me yep. this about five, eight years ago. I write down three things I'm grateful for from the past 24 hours and just God, you're, you're the source of these blessings in my life. One thing I need grace for mm. and, and three thing, three goals I have that I think honor God that day. Um, but the grace thing, I don't know how else to say it, but I really have to go to my dark place. Mm of what, God, here's how I dishonored you yesterday. And here's, I put myself first and I did not care about you or your word. And um, it's a humbling place. Yeah. But the reason I end with goals is like, hey, God wants me to keep moving. Yeah. He gives me grace and I'm not gonna live my day in light of my sin. I'm gonna live my day in light of his grace, hopefully. I love that practice, repeat it, because I think someone's gonna do this. Three things you're grateful for. Four. Three things I'm grateful, so it's three Gs. Yep. Grateful, grace, goals. Oh. So three things I'm grateful for, one thing I need grace for, yep. three goals I have for the day. So it's real simple. I love that. Coded in prayer yep. and get going. I think someone's going to do that. Carl, thank you so much for hopping on oh, so fun, and man. being a part of it. You at home, I want to give you one more opportunity uh, to be a part of the online world and really join in. If you text the words SE online, you'll see all the ways that you can be involved. SE online to 733-733. But coming up, uh, we're in the middle of a series on the Ten Commandments called The Good Life because we think the good life is found in God's word. It takes things from cloudiness to clarity, and we're going to be going through that on Thursday nights. Not this week, but our next one's in the next Thursday. So text SE online to 733-733. Follow the ways to sign up. We'll send you an email and send you the details. But on behalf of uh, the church and Carl and everyone here, we're so glad you're part of worship. Carl, thank you again. Y'all have a wonderful week. We'll see you back next week.